Hello everyone, it's so nice to be back here. It's been 22 years since I first set foot on this stage. And it's just so nice to be here today and see new faces, old faces. It's nice to be home. Now time is of the essence with today's presentation, so I'm going to go ahead and start with our first visual poem. Now direct your attention to this video. Hands. They're for rain, flowers, grass, trees. They paint the bigger picture. That gentleman, Clayton Valley, he's a famous ASL poet, and he's known for his use of classifiers, which are really the foundation of ASL poetry and the creative essence. It's part of the soul and foundation of ASL. And he's put many years into this research and this practice, so that's what I'd like to discuss today is ASL literature. That's what I would like to dive into today, is the foundation of ASL literature. It's more than just the signs and the surface level. There's many different working parts and different aspects to this, various rules that go into the bigger picture. Now, the basic foundation, there's four I'd like to highlight. Regulatory language, speed of the story or rate, and paralinguistic choices. Those are really the basic structure of ASL literature. Choice of language, the rate, you really need to draw people in, and that makes a successful performer. Now, there's many factors to this, as you can see on the screen, but we can't delve into all of them because we would be here all day and all night. Now, I wasn't always an ASL performer growing up. I was a little more reserved. My father did perform visual vernacular, and I went to a deaf school, so I did have these little tidbits that I took in from various ASL stories I saw, different performances, but I didn't realize I had it in me until later. When I was a senior in high school, I went to a deaf school in Wisconsin, and there was a pageant, a Miss Wisconsin pageant. And I was thinking, me and that? Oh, please, that is not my thing. But my family encouraged me to go, and I got up on stage and competed. And this was the first time I did an ABC story about a Harley Davidson motorcycle. And I was a nervous wreck up there sharing this story. Then when I came to college, I just really flourished. And ever since then, it's been 25 years now, I travel all over to perform and I just really cherish this experience to go into various schools, colleges, community events, working with children, and just really giving people this exposure to ASL literature. Education is pertinent. Many teachers of the deaf are hearing. And some of them don't know much about deaf culture. They look at ASL and it's very gestural, very animated, but that's not the case. ASL is an actual language. There's many rules. So it's so important that we teach people about this aspect of ASL literature and educate the community and encourage everyone to get involved and really cherish this. This woman here, her work is so unique. She incorporates so many different aspects into her pieces. Classifiers, various language, almost like film stills, different perspectives, different speeds. It really draws you in. And the end result is just beautiful. I've watched this piece over and over again, and I must show you the entire snippet. I can't just show you a piece of it. It's about four minutes, so enjoy.
Incredible, right? So unique. ASL literature has become more and more popular over the years. But there's something I'd like to discuss. I need to be honest with you all. I've noticed there's many men who have visual vernacular performances. But when it comes to finding pieces done by women, you really have to dig to find them. I really would love to see more women recognized for their work in visual vernacular. As you can see with the piece I just showed, it's incredible. There's so many different pieces involved. And that leads us to my next topic of discussion. The foundations of ASL literature really focus on three aspects. Senses that relate to the deaf experience. Our feelings, things that impact our thoughts. Visuals, touch, smell. The senses in our body that make us who we are and are our soul. We take in these things and have these overlaps. And then they come out through our emotions. We can play with language, play with words, be creative with our emotions. That's really the essence and the soul of ASL literature. For children all the way up to adults, the important aspect of this is prosody. Now, with hearing people, you have intonation and language. Well, with ASL, you have this visual prosody. In the education system, teachers of the deaf, if they're hearing, don't fully understand this visual prosody and inflection. That's why we need deaf teachers, deaf storytellers to really teach young people about this creative process and all of the factors that go into visual language. That's what's covered in those three books on the slide. A huge part of ASL literature is humor. Deaf people pass this on from generation to generation, and it's a huge part of deaf culture. Now, MJ Bienvenu puts this into four categories. She says that deaf people take oppression from society, and then they come up with these stories and play on words through sign language in order to express their feelings through poetry. And if you remember that list I showed earlier of the different parameters of ASL literature, well, humor comes up in each of those categories. I'm sure you're all familiar with the one story about deaf King Kong who crushes the woman who he wants to propose to. Well, I'm sure you may be wondering where that story originated, and I'd like to point you to MJ Bienvenu. Her piece, Don't Sign With Your Hands Full, well, that is an ASL story about visual art, which has circulated. It's important that we recognize this flow of information, this documentation of stories that's passed on between generations. For deaf people, for hearing people, for all creatives, we must document these pieces to pass on. I was involved with the National Theater of the Deaf, and a huge part of that is humor. This is one of my favorite videos. It's called My Third Eye with the legendary Patrick Graybill, RIT's Legacy. Now, with humor in production, you have culture and you have language, and they come together to give you this product. If you don't have either of those parts, things get lost in translation. I'd like to share this short snippet from My Third Eye. In their world, we saw that because they do not use their hands, they have a fear of touching.
The point in showing this video is that hearing people are often shocked by deaf culture, and we have to laugh about it. In the face of oppression, we have to respond with humor. So incorporating, you know, the hearing phrase, one ear out the other, and deaf culture, when you mix that together with some humor, then it makes for a great performance. And it's a great way to combat oppression. So again, keep that in mind. Humor will help you throughout your life, especially in the face of adversity. That leads us to deaf folklore, whether it be through the education system, the community, everyday life. We have to remember that 95% of deaf children are born to hearing parents and are put in mainstream schools, which means that they may lose this sense of identity and culture. We have so many technological advances and educational advances, but this culture and the folklore aspect is still so important. The example of the Super Bowl Pepsi commercial shows this, that we need to pass on these tales to future generations. You must have this cultural understanding, this linguistic understanding to get the bigger picture, the overall story. And if you're missing one, it can't come to fruition. Many deaf children struggle with their identity due to cultural deprivation, language deprivation. We see this happen often, which enforces the fact that ASL literature is so important. Still on the topic of folklore, over my 25 years in acting and performing, there's this theme that comes up frequently, that of trees. There's many sign performances with this symbol, with this metaphor of trees. I see it with Alame, with Valley. But this isn't something that we're shown as deaf people. I graduated college and went off to start my life. And when I came back for my master's degree, it was then that I realized through conversation with various people about this tree metaphor. And you see this come up often. The tree is used because you have the strong trunk and branches, and then you have the roots. And those roots represent resistance and having that strong foundation, which can be related to the deaf soul and our essence. Through adversity, we stand strong and grow and flourish. So it's a great parallel to use the strong tree and deaf people. And I think that's a reason that we see it come up in visual art so frequently. And these are only a few examples on the screen here. Also, these individuals had never met. It's not like they had a convention and talked about using this tree but you see it in so many different people's work. That people just choose this metaphor to share their experience. And I really would love to do more research on this topic and how information is passed and shared and really just change the system as a whole. Now folklore through means of art. This means taking sign language and putting it into these physical art pieces in the face of adversity, showing the deaf experience. I remember back when I was 16, 17 years old, I noticed in much of my art there was the hand shapes, the visual aspects showing eyes in the hands. It really focused on my experience as a deaf person. And I see this pop up in many people's work using this metaphor of trees, as you can see in these pieces on the screen here. There's trees, there's fish. But the point of all of this is that it really shows the deaf experience and the culture, whether it's deaf people of color, deaf blind people, this common experience in the symbol of trees shows up in many people's work. 
I went to the mag last night to look at their show. And again, I saw these same images in that show. And it's really quite amazing. Now shifting to the topic of fish. Again, trees show pride, unity, being grounded, following your roots, not being swayed by the storm or affected by the elements, just standing tall through adversity. Now I want to shift our focus to the concept of fish. Many deaf people have made this connection with their own identity to that of fish. One example, a story from one of my classes um, in the master's program, this student on the screen here, Jess, we were chatting about poetry and she had made a comment about fish. And I said, wait a minute, explain more about that message with fish. And through her description, I realized, wow, I have these same thoughts. It was just mind blowing that we came together and had this shared experience and we had never met before, but the message stays the same. We need to persevere, stand up to adversity, and work to change the system and the community together. The fish message stays the same, whether it be through classifiers, sign performances, video. ASL and art and film have an interesting parallel. It doesn't matter if it's showing signs through an art piece on a paper or a signed story. There's this easy transition because it is a visual language. These are the foundations of ASL. This is important and also a bit jarring. Now, related to gender, male or female in this situation, I've noticed in a lot of ASL literature, it happens time and time again, that men have this uh, air to them, this confidence. They're bold in their storytelling. Then when you look to women, they're made to seem weak scared, timid, which is very different than this sense of masculinity. As you can see up here, women sometimes appear to be more energetic and excited. That's the message that we see time and time again. I find it fascinating because really what we should be doing is taking aspects from all different types of people and incorporating it into our work. Regardless of gender, we as deaf people have similar internal struggles. Whether you identify as a woman or a man, there's these gender stereotypes that women are meek and they're, oh, you know, I can't do that. I'm lousy. Oh, no, I couldn't possibly. Well, we need to break that habit and stigma and stand up and really show our story and be honest with people, be open minded. Everyone has their own struggles, their own experiences, their own trauma. This forms our identity. ASL literature helps us paint this image, show our culture, show our confidence in how deaf people flourish. This can be applied to the education system, how we teach our children in the community. That's a fact. Shifting the focus to deafblind artists, I once met a man named Gino. And he had explained showing the struggle of visual language and touch through his work. So through our conversation, he had shared that he shows this through metaphor of a yin and yang symbol and a tree. So now at the roots, you have deaf people, people of color, very suppressed groups. And then the top of the tree, that's where you have the emotions, the visual parts, visual access, the struggle that people face every day. And as you move down, you add levels of oppression and adversity. But the yin and yang showed this beautifully. 
out of curiosity, have you all seen diversity in mainstream deaf art? For example, this image in the corner here, that was by a woman of color. And Black ASL literature is so important. But I feel like there isn't enough representation. We as privileged white deaf people need to help raise the voices of artists of color, get more recognition for their work, help them flourish. It's our responsibility. Because honestly, I'm sick and tired of seeing the same old stuff from white people. We need more diversity in the messages for our young people. Now, the final topic for today that really ties it together is about digital art. It's so important with all of the new technology that's really taken off. We have to be innovative, creative in how we incorporate this new digital world into our ASL literature and art. When teaching future generations, we need to match them. We need to figure out how to make it interesting. We don't want them bored or distracted. We have to adapt our way of teaching to match the younger generation. As the older generation, we really have to catch up. Stay with the times. Maybe someday we'll have hologram performances. Now I want to share this wonderful example of digital art. Bravo, Matt, you did a wonderful job with that piece. And it just goes to show that this is such a wonderful platform for visual language. And as educators, it's our job to promote this shift in mindset, remind deaf artists to come together and use these new digital platforms for their art. Here's the last one. The takeaway from my presentation today is that it's time to change our mindset. We need to teach deaf children to be creative, to embrace our language and our culture. Much like seeds, we have to plant these deaf seeds so they can grow and flourish. It's our responsibility to pass on our language and culture, and ASL literature is a great way to do this. Thank you.